In our study of the book of Ephesians, uh, we left off in chapter 2. We'll begin reading with verse number 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. I'll be reading from King James. All right, it's wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made with hands or made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who had made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, or to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace unto you which were afar off, and to them which were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. <clears throat> now, In previous verses in this chapter, Paul talked about <clears throat> our salvation from sin. How that God has, had made us alive again who were dead in our trespasses and sin. And he talks about in past times how the Gentiles walked according to the, uh, the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air or the influence of the world uh, he said it was the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience and then he says among whom also we Jews like Wayne talked about he's, he, he talks about the Jews then he talks about the Gentiles he's back and forth here he's talking about the Jews in verse 3 among whom also we all had our conversation so Paul re Paul talks about that even though the Jews were exceptional in the sight of God, Jews were the chosen people, they too uh, were uh, children of disobedience, subject to the wrath of God because of their disobedience. He said, we all, we all had our conversation and pastime in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were naturally the children of wrath, even as others. Uh, but God who is rich in mercy. And we talked about what it means to be rich. Does anyone recall? When he talks about being rich in mercy. Uh, God. No matter how heinous the crimes we've committed. Against God. He's willing ready to forgive us in that 
perspective, he's rich. His love is the same way. And it talks about it as we move along. We'll talk about that. But God who is rich in mercy and his great love. Great love. Great love. Why does Paul, he says that a couple of times in this series of verses. God's great love. What, what, what is he talking about? <clears throat> you know, when God created man, man did not have the ability to preserve himself, to save himself, or to protect or care for himself, uh, or even to support himself. It was God because it was his will. He created man was in his mind way before he created the world. And he created this world upon which we live as human beings. And he placed in this world the ability to support us. This earth feeds us. This earth clothes us. Uh, this earth uh, provides for uh, the materials for us to protect ourselves from the elements through shelter. It's perfect for what God created it for. But man has done what? He has created uh, through his greed and lust and so forth and so on uh, uh, poverty and oppression uh, in the world. And he talks about that as we move along. He says, but God who is rich in mercy and his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sin. Man had no ability uh, to preserve himself against the consequences of sin. But God did it because he wanted to. And there's a, what was his motive for doing all that he does for us? What's God's motive? Okay, love. Ultimately, ultimately, because he had to love us before we could love him. But ultimately, our work for God is found in, in, in chapter six, I mean chapter one, verse six and verse twelve. We are to praise God for what He's done for us. That's what motivates Him to do for us all that He does. Is our job is to praise, it says in verse six, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. And in verse twelve he says that we should be to the praise of his glory. Who first trusted in Christ. So God did what he did for us out of love for us. And if we love him. We, sh we are to praise him for all that he's done for us. We ought to make it known uh, to all with whom we have to do. Uh, and we can't be ashamed or we can't be afraid or embarrassed. To talk about from where God delivered us. Because he says just like the, Gent the Jews were just like the Gentiles. You know, we, we were out there too. Uh, Moses asked God, show me your glory. So the Lord tells you, I can't let you see my face. But he also has this comment about how gracious to me. The Lord is hinting to Moses that your glory is different. Are one and the same. I mean, that, that is the true glory of God. Not just how awesome. But also that in spite of his awesome, because of his awesome. Okay, and we'll come back. That's in Exodus 33, am I right? He's good. He would, <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that in just okay, a couple God minutes. Is one. John, John says one. Well, this, is there a difference between God's grace and God's salvation? So no question that they're connected. But does that mean... All of us, all of us have a tendency to lose, well, the, the, the possibility that we can lose our salvation. There's, 
there is there is a point where we attain our salvation. There are points where we maintain our salvation. Uh, just because we attain salvation doesn't mean that ultimately we will be saved. Because we could lose it. We could lose it. And so when God talks about grace, does grace is grace a <clears throat> blessing from God when life as we know it is over? Does grace follow us into eternity? Will we have to pray when life on earth as we know it is over? There are some things that will end in death. If The only way we can know uh, what it is, is now. We know what it is now. Now, if... Yes. But is grace the same as redemption? <clears throat> well, we'll talk about that in... in it's coming up. <laughs> it's coming up. Uh, <clears throat> but he says in verse 4 of chapter 2... But God, who is rich in mercy and his great love, with which wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace we are saved through faith. <clears throat> God can be as gracious as he can be, but that doesn't void our responsibility to him. We must accept his grace. And accepting his grace has its discipline. There are things that demonstrate that we accept his grace. He doesn't force it on us or anything like that. He makes it available to us for our acceptation. And <clears throat> that's why his work comes first, the grace part. And we understand what grace involves. Uh, uh, all of the things that we don't deserve is, it, it, uh, uh, makes up the grace of God, which is his, his um, compassion. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve it. His uh, forbearance, his patience, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in, he, he endures the offenses we commit against him over and over and over again. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve that. But he offers it. He makes it available to us. His long suffering. The quality of self restraint. In the face of provocation. He's not hasty. To uh, retaliate against us. Or punish us. When we do sin. Um, and we don't deserve that. Leniency. We don't deserve that. All of that is a part of grace. All of those. Those, those areas fit comfortably. Into the term. A grace, uh, uh, responsiveness. We can talk to the Lord uh, in prayer and we can actually uh, influence him to change his mind. And that's being tender heartedness. Do we deserve that? No. No, we don't. But he offers it. He extends it. But now we have a role to play in our own redemption. Grace is a gift from God. Faith is is our gift to God. And it must be present. It must be present in order for uh, the promises that God has made to us can be fulfilled. <clears throat> so he says, if you love me, you keep, you keep my word, you keep my commandment. So uh, he says, even when we're dead in sins, trespasses and sins, he hath quickened us together with him, with Christ, with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And he says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heaven in Christ Jesus according to verse uh, number 6. And then verse 7, uh, That in the ages to come, he says, He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. 
through Jesus Christ. Listen, God blesses all of us and all, all who are outside of Christ. He has blessings for all men. But all of the blessings, every blessing in heaven is only found in Christ. How does one, be, how does one get into Christ? For as many of you as have been baptized, have been baptized into Christ. All of heaven's blessings, the best heaven has to offer, are available only to those in Christ. And, 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 and uh, uh, being in Christ uh, means being in the church that Christ built. And there's only one, of, one church in the scriptures. There's only one in the scriptures, and that's the church that Christ built. He goes on to say, for by grace you are saved through faith, verse 8, chapter 2. For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even uh, the faith that God uh, allows us uh, uh, to produce within ourselves is a gift from God. Not only his grace, but the faith that we have. He says, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship. Tell me what that means, if anybody can uh, answer that question. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, good, good point. There are a lot of things I agree with on that. Let's look at the verse again and we're going to ask the question. Reminding us. He reminds us as well. But the verse is 10 of chapter 2, book of Ephesians. For we are, for we, for we, for we, for we. Are his workmanship where? Created where? In Christ. Who made this? Sam Samsung. This is Samsung's workmanship. This is Samsung's workmanship. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship, his handiwork. He put us together. And the, sec the, the, the new birth, 
being in Christ Jesus, says to us, what does he say? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. For those who didn't know life's purpose, here it is. Here it is right here. Good works. Here it is. He prepared us in Christ to walk in good works. We are his workmanship. He created us. This is his handiwork. He can look down on us and say, yeah, that's my workmanship. That's my craftiness. Good product. Yeah, yeah, and God, and God ain't made, God didn't make any junk. Yes. Uh, I had it in my head. <laughs> So he says, in the very next verse, he says, wherefore do what? What does he say? Remember. 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 When you go out there to do great works. Remember. It could have been you. That needed the help that you are able to offer. Remember. He says wherefore remember. That ye being in past time Gentiles in the flesh. Who are called uncircumcision by that which is called a circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And strangers from the covenant of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. Remember. Our responsibility, God created us in Christ. Ordained us to do good works. And as you do, remember, you were at one time in the same place. We were at one time in the same place, yes. This idea here. And we're not actually saved by anything. But... And so will we. <laughs> so, right. so, yeah, well, I mean, thankfully, God gracious to save us. He's willing to tolerate, I think. He's willing to save us and try to repair us in spite of our That's his great love. That is his great love. His great love and his great mercy. Yeah. At some point, if the equipment's trying to try to be the best. And he knows that too. And he, only he can say that. But this is. A, he says. But look at verse 13. He says. But now. Where? In Christ Jesus. You see the role of the church. In God's plan to redeem man. The church is the plan. It's not a part of the plan. It, it is the plan. It was in his mind before the foundation of the world. You see the importance of the role of the church. He says, but now, in Christ Jesus, you are, you, ye who were sometime far off are made nigh through the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He's our peace. Our peace with who? It is. It's peace with God and peace with man.
not going to be saved by being special. Now, exactly what Paul wrote it, possible. So, in fact, he continues to talk about it, particularly, it raises a question: Are there any things that we might use markers of identity to distinguish? The Bible does not. Stand in for circumcision today. Disciples in Christ alienated. I raise that question. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, anyone can speak up at any time. Verse 14 For he is our peace who hath made both one hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, the Jews and the Gentiles, <clears throat> having abolished in his flesh the enmity between the two, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make where? In himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So making peace. <clears throat> when we look at these, bless you, uh, these series of verses, turn to Galatians 3, and let's look at verse 24 and 25. In Galatians 3, verse 24 and 25. What does it say? For ye are all through Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is no specific nationality, no socio-economic difference, no gender difference, uh, no race difference, for ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and as according to the promise. Yes. Did it. Oh, God did. I'll, I'll take issue with that, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
righteousness and not for your greatness, but the Lord has chosen you because you are a stubborn people, a stiff-necked people, and not a great people. Demonstrate his power, his great love, his mercy. To demonstrate it. So he, so his glory, and so he can be recognized for his glory, his character, his, his brilliance, and all of those characteristics that he commands that we grow. We are to grow in grace as well toward our fellow man. You know, lenient, long-suffering, all of those things. Nothing that they deserve. Let me ask you a question. Have, have, how many of you have had enemies? You know, you might not want to admit it. But we all either have or have had them. Now, how many of you have approached your enemy to reconcile? That too. At least the effort was there. I'm asking, did you make the effort? God did. God did, again, his great love and mercy. God did. While we were yet sinners Christ died for us and 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 what do we do with that why did he do that so that we would praise him so that we would glorify him so that we would tell of his goodness and his kindness and you know you know you know a person by their fruit the works. That's another name for works. By their fruit. Uh, um, uh, people will know if you are a child of the devil or a child of God by the things you say or do. And if God has done, which he has, uh, enormously, that he, you know, uh, he says this is what he wants from us. That's what he prepared us for. He ordained us to do that, to praise him for what he's done. That's, that's all he wants. That's all he wants. That's all he's asking for. And remaining obedient to that command, yes. Does he? Yeah, yeah. To, uh, 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 uh. That's, that's what he did. He reached out while we were yet sinners, enemies. And he made peace through Christ. His son. His son. His son. We love him because he first loved us. Man would not know what love is if we're not for God. Let me ask another question. Uh, is there power in the gospel to dissolve the enmity in the human heart against man. Okay. How does he how does the gospel do it then? Because it's important for us to know this. We're talking about practical ways to deal with issues. In order for us to deal with practical issues, we have to know what God expects of us. How to, how to deal with it. But what makes the man, what makes him receive it? Because man can be hard-hearted. I mean, more people have not received God than have. Okay. Have it, and have it, and 
You'll have more of it, always. If you don't have it, then it's not going to ever happen. But it's kind of this principle which has to be more than you don't have even more than So we're going out in the field, scattering seeds, you know, it lands on the roadside. That's the heart of the person. And the roadside be eroded, elements change it, terminate. God knows that only God can do. Hey, the sower doesn't get out there. Right? Hey, and the seed itself doesn't do anything unless the soil is. Okay, try this one on. The gospel comes with blessings and consequences. Blessings if we're obedient, consequences if we're not. Is that enough to change a man's heart against another man? Is that enough? Again, it has to do with whether or not he even believes. It did not. It did not. In the face of all the punishment, you put terror in front of him, you put punishment in front of him, you put all kinds of consequences in front of him, did it change their heart? What's going to make them do that? to them over and over and over the reasonable choice of the unreasonable choice. If you've ever tried to reconcile with an enemy, how would you do it? How would you do it? How, how would you do it? What would be the first thing you would say? Usually make you make enemies because you're, somebody offended you in some way. Some way you were offended, whether something they did or something they said. We're getting there now. We're getting there now. We're getting there. I forgive you. I forgive you. That's where it starts. That's where reconciliation starts. That's where God started. Mm -hmm. He was willing with his great love and his great mercy, no matter how heinous the crime was you, you committed against him, he was ready and willing to forgive. That's what changes a heart. Because the offender knows that he doesn't deserve it. He knows that he doesn't. Amen. But too much, too often, what happens? Well, you know, they should know they offended me. They should come to me. They should fix this. So, they wait for people to wake up and magically realize that they've done some horrible thing, figure it out, and come to the That's not how it works. Mm -mm. That ain't how it's ever worked. Right? If God treated mm. us that way,
Yes. Yes. Some doctrinal panelist uh-huh. uh-huh. Problem first. That's the real problem first. <laughs> and why? Only only that person knows. If you have ought with your brother before you make your offering, you know. I mean, you. That's what the Bible teaches. It is forgiveness that begins the process of changing a person's heart. Especially when you, you know you deserve the consequences of your action. <clears throat> he says in verse 16 of, ch- of chapter 2, he says, And that you might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You slay the you slay the enmity through forgiveness, through forgiveness, and reaching out, as Wayne said, <clears throat> because uh, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace unto you who are afar off, and to them who were not, talking about the Gentiles and the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. We both have access. The wall is gone. Now therefore ye, Gentiles, are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, with the Christians of the household of God. Saints and Christians can be used interchangeably here. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building. Fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also build it together. For a habitation of God through the spirit. God lives here through the spirit. He promised us. He promised us. Where his name is, that's where he will meet with us. And it says to me, he's here, he's uh, willing and able to hear our petitions, and willing and able to fulfill all of our needs. So why would we want to miss the gathering together where God will be present? As tired as I can be sometimes, like today, As long as I have breath, I'll be at the assembly. As tired as I am, as tired as I can get. Because there's a power in in the word of God that strengthens me. And I'm not exclusive to this. I've seen it and felt it for a long, long time. There is power in the word of God. There is power. That'll do it. Uh, as everyone prepares to re-enter the auditorium, we'll yield to uh, the song leader.